ಮ್ಯಾಮ್ ಶಿವಯ್ಯ a very good evening to all as we all know today january 12th we celebrate the birthday of swami vekananda this day is also a day which remind us all the youth to rise and awaken for the call of swami vekananda for a youth for a generation with nerves with steel muscles made of iron and supernatural will our youth nationwide celebrate this day as shiva jagruti for today we have brahmacharini amrita chaitanya ji to inspire us with her talk sharing a quick intro about her she first met amma in paris when she was 13 years old and she first came to india when she was 16 years old at the age of 19 she joined amma sashram as her disciple born in uk and brought up and educated in france one may quite wonder what made her choose the life of sadhana so today let me welcome brahmacharini amrita chaitanya ji to share and enlighten her to tell us the story and wisdom what led her how did she navigate her direction towards amma i welcome amrita chaitanya ji now shivaya om amriteshwari namaha warm welcome to all of you i wish this could have been a face to face meeting and probably many of you feel a little frustrated everything being online these days especially when your classes are online too So thank you to all of you for taking the time to come to yet another online event so we can share some moments together. We're all brothers and sisters. And Amma says where there's where there's love there's no distance. So let's all use the power of our imagination to forget that we're all watching this from our individual rooms and houses and imagine this is some kind of a real family gathering. A few days ago during bhajan time amma was talking to the ashram kids and she said even if someone has many phd's if they don't know how to swim they're going to drown if their boat capsizes amma said spirituality is to learn to swim or to learn to float no matter which difficulties may be coming our way see through spirituality we become strong enough to face any challenges with courage and with grace i heard these words of amma and thought they're so appropriate in these times these troubled times there are several bhajans that are sung here in the ashram that compare our life to a boat there's one in particular that was written by amma herself in nude jeevita the first line of that bhajan says oh mother my boat is sinking here in the ocean of this world and i think most of the world would agree at this point for most of us it feels like the journey of our life is traveling over troubled waters so in the last 9 months or so our lives have been turned upside down in some way or other with nations across the world there have been lockdowns and stringent social distancing measures our movements have been so restricted some of us may feel a little bit down because of all these restrictions some of you may feel a little bit sad also that you haven't been able to see amma this year also all your classes are online and you may be missing the atmosphere of the campus we're not able to spend time with our friends and relatives so we may be feeling a little frustrated with the whole situation especially the young people it may feel like our freedom has been snatched away from us unfairly this whole time may feel a little bit like a long and tedious dark tunnel which is waiting to see the light at the end of it but what we need to understand is that difficulties and challenges are part and parcel of life they're part and parcel of everyone's life the difference is how we face those challenges See Amma says a boat can float on water but if the water gets into the boat it'll sink similarly we can live in the world but if the problems of the world get into our minds we will end up drowning in them instead let the boat of your life carry you to your destination there's a story that Amma tells I'd like to share with you as a little boy one day finds the, the cocoon of a butterfly and he's very curious he wants to see the butterfly come out of the cocoon so he takes it home with him and then 
a little crack appears on the cocoon and he sees a small worm starting to come out, struggling to come out of the narrow opening. So the little boy is really watching carefully. But then the little worm stops moving and stays still just like that for several hours. So the boy thinks that it got stuck and he thinks, oh, let me help him out. So he goes and gets a pair of scissors and carefully tries to cut the remaining part of the cocoon off. Then this little butterfly falls out, but the butterfly's body was much more swollen than usual and its wings were tiny and shriveled. Actually, the, bo the boy then looked at the butterfly, just waiting, expecting the butterfly's wings to grow and the butterfly to fly away, but nothing happened at all. In the end, the poor butterfly with its swollen body and tiny shriveled wings slowly dra dragged away. See, we perceive that strenuous effort and the struggle of the butterfly to come out of the cocoon as a big difficulty. But in fact, it is that, str that struggle, that effort, that enables the butterfly to then spread its wings and fly away. So let's remember to be patient, even in challenging times, and to keep courage. Because if we approach the difficult times with the right attitude, we'll really be able to grow from them. If we approach challenges with the right attitude, we can take those challenges in our stride. If we don't do that, we might end up in a downward spiral of feeling resentful towards the situation and also feeling sorry for ourselves. Okay, so now the question is, how are we supposed to take these times, these times of COVID pandemic, of lockdown restrictions, how do we take all this in our stride? So do you know about boats? Boats every few years need a kind of servicing, like how you take car for a servicing. But for a boat, what happens is there's a place called a dry dock. The boat navigates into that area, and that area is closed, closes behind the boat, so it's like an enclosed area, and then the water is drained away from that dry dock. So basically, it's a way to get the boat out of the water. The boat then sits on a kind of frame. So this is done to enable the inspection and the repair of the hull of the boat, the, the bottom of the boat is called the hull. So I think for most of us here, not everyone, but most of us, most of the people in the world, because of all these restrictions, somehow our lives have had to slow down a little, even if we're not very happy with that, maybe. I feel we should really take the mo make the most of this situation, approach it in a positive way, and see it as our time in the dry dock. This is the boat of our life in the dry dock. See, it's a time when we can pause and introspect we can inspect and repair the boat of our life. We need to think, stop and reflect about what our goals are and press the reset button. When I was a kid, we lived in France and the canal was a really nice green environment to live in. So even while still being in the city. So my parents decided to purchase a boat and they purchased a houseboat. People lived in those along the canal. It was a common thing. So they bought a boat, but the boat was several hundred miles away from where we lived. So my father and a sailor friend of his set off to bring, navigate the boat back down to the south of France where we lived. So the beginning of the journey went very well. It was just along rivers and canals. But then there was one part, like they had to come from one river to go into the next river. And in that they had to cross through the ocean. Now, the problem is that houseboats are not at all designed to go along the, in the ocean because their hull, the bottom of the boat, really can't cut through waves. So it's a really risky thing to take a houseboat to the ocean. So my father knew this and they chose a day where the predictions were for a very calm ocean so they could have an easy crossing. They set off early in the morning, but as soon as they got into the ocean, like out, in, into the ocean, the ocean started becoming rough and agitated. Very big waves started forming. They got really scared because, see, with a ship that's designed to go in the ocean, it cuts through those waves. But this little houseboat, what would happen is, 
with every wave forming, the boat would rise up with the wave and then come down with a big crash under the water. And that kept happening over and over again. They really were doubting whether they'd make it with the boat in a single piece. They were really scared. Somehow, with the grace of God, they made it with the boat in a whole one single piece and actually very little damage in the end, except maybe some extra gray hair on my father's head from the stress of the event. Then, from then on, for the remaining part of the journey, my mother, my brother and myself, we went and joined them. And within a few days, arrived in the city where we live. And we moored the boat up in a fixed place. And that was to be our home for the next few years. So we talked about the dry dock where the servicing happens. But that's only every few years. At the same time, if you live on a boat, there's some things you need to be careful of for the maintenance of the boat throughout the year. Because of course, on a boat, any time, a leak can happen. So what we did is, in one end of the boat, in the, with the inside of the hull, we installed a water pump. And that would detect the water that would come in and pump it back out into the canal. So that's what I had to say about boat. So now let's come to the boat of our life. So remember now, we're trying to imagine this time when our freedoms are so restricted, this is our time in the dry dock. It's our time for servicing. So when we're inspecting the boat of our life and the hull of the boat, what do we need to look out for? Remember in the story with my father, how the boat kept crashing down under the waves. It was because the hull of the boat wasn't adapted for big waves. That was the problem. So it risked breaking. So what is a strong hull in the boat of our life? A strong hull is a focus on a higher principle. Underlying our everyday should be an aspiration for a higher goal. The beauty of it is it's entirely up to each one of us to determine what that goal is going to be. Each of us needs to ask ourselves, what kind of a human being do I want to be? What kind of values do I want to uphold? Later on, when I look back on my life, what kind of a life do I want to see? So we need to think of what what images, what ideas inspire us the most? Is it a life of integrity, where our thoughts, our actions, and our words are all in harmony, in sync with each other? Is it a life of truth, free of hypocrisy, when we deceive neither ourselves nor others? Is it a life of tolerance, free from narrow-minded judgments about people? Or it could be a life of sacrifice, when our main focus is what we can give to others, and also protecting nature. So we need to think and tailor our goal, just how we like it, how, what inspires us. And we can aspire to such goals, regardless of the beliefs and backgrounds. And also we don't really know where we came from before we arrived on this, on this, in this life through our mother's womb. The one thing that all of us know is that we are here now. We have this life, we have this moment, that's all we can be sure of. So we need to strive to, be, to try to uplift ourselves in every moment. And just through that effort, our lives become meaningful. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna says, Udhared Atman Atmanam, uplift yourself through yourself. And Amma tells us the same thing. She says, lift yourself up. You yourself are the thorns along your path. And you yourself are the flowers on your path. A few years ago, it was here in the ashram, there was a very crowded darshan day. And some devotees, some Western devotees, came and asked me if I could help them when they went for darshan to translate their question to Amma. So I agreed. But that day ended up being a very busy day for me in the kitchen. By the end of the day, I felt quite exhausted. I went to the darshan hall at 10 p.m. to see the status. And the darshan was going very strong. As always, our amma was completely, looking completely fresh and full of energy. But the queue was still very long. And I figured that it would take a few more hours before the person I had promised to help would go for darshan. So seeing as I felt so tired, I thought, fine, let me go and sleep for a couple of hours and then come and do the translation. So I went to my room. 
it was 10. So I set my alarm for midnight and I immediately fell asleep to a deep, deep sleep. And believe me, when my alarm went off at midnight, I was not very happy about it. All I wanted to do was just roll over and go back to sleep. I would have given anything to do that. But then the image, I just, the image of those people came to my mind and I thought I, I have to go down because I promised that I'd help them. So I splashed some water on my face. And before leaving my room, I just glanced at the mirror. I glanced at my face in the mirror and I got a shock because I looked absolutely terrible. My eyelids were all swollen. My face looked all puffy. And the worst part was there was the, 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 the mark of the mat that I'd slept on all over my forehead and cheek on one side. See, these days, we're so used to wearing a face mask when we go out and we might be about it. But that day I would have been so grateful for a face mask, but that was no option. So with no other option, I headed down to the Darshan Hall. I went with the people I was to help to the stage and the stage was bustling with activity. The pigeons were loud. The lights were so bright and blinding. Everyone seemed so enthusiastic and energetic and cheerful. And there's still a very long darshan line. And all I wanted to do was run away and hide and go to sleep. So I thought, fine, let's try and get this over and done with as fast as possible. So the people were in the line and I went to my usual spot where I kneeled down in front of Amman the side ready to pop up and translate the question when that person comes for darshan. But then, and I was secretly hoping that the, it would be fast and that Amma wouldn't really look at my face and wouldn't notice me and I'd just be able to leave. But then I suddenly realized that Amma was looking at me. Actually, she had paused the darshan and was staring at me. To make things worse, when Amma starts staring at something, then everyone else around Amma also starts staring to see what Amma's looking at. I just wish that the stage could open up before me, under me and just swallow me up. I was absolutely sure that Amma was about to make some comment about what I looked like. And in my mind, I was frantically rehearsing my reply to Amma. I'm sorry, Amma. I was tired. I went to sleep and I just woke up. I'm sorry. <laughs> but then, Amma started talking and she's, do you know what she said? She said, you know, it's so important to learn Sanskrit. Amma once, her eyes were glistening, were sparkling with enthusiasm and she was saying how she has a vision. She wants everyone in the ashram to learn Sanskrit, to be able to converse in Sanskrit, to be able to learn the scriptures in Sanskrit. Like this, she went on for some time, all about Sanskrit. See, just look at the contrast between my perspective and Amma's perspective. Our focus is always on the most physical and external level. We're in the world of our ego. We're in that selfishness. Our whole world revolves around me and mine. Whereas Amma always sees beyond that. She sees a higher level. When she looks at us, she sees our higher potential. And through all her words and actions, she's just trying to lift us out of our darkness, to pull us up to something higher, to pull us up towards light. Many people may argue that in today's world, values are so degraded. Where do we see truthfulness and integrity around us? We see conflict and dissonance, even in the family unit. So that being the case, is it realistic to aspire for ideals as high and lofty as tolerance and sacrifice when we feel like the world is just dragging us down? But you know, we need to have the strength to take it in the opposite way. If we see adharma and negativity around us, that should give us more inspiration and determination to not be like that ourselves. When I was a student, I had a friend who was a little older than me. And she, I really feel she taught me how to be a good friend. From her, I learned things that I hadn't given importance to before. Just small things about how you value someone and appreciate them. Just small things, for example, remembering someone's birthday and celebrate just some offering some gift or some small thing to market. Or if you go on a trip somewhere, 
you bring back some small token gift for your friend, however small it is. But just that expression of appreciation and care. So I learned this from her and I really felt she was my best friend. But then one day she got some new friends and basically she stopped being interested in spending time with me. Pretty well overnight, she seemed to completely stop caring. She'd forget my birthday, whereas previously she'd get so upset if I was only even a few hours late in remembering hers. So all her tokens of care came to an abrupt halt overnight. So at the beginning, I felt pretty upset. I felt hurt. I felt she was being so unfair. A few days I felt like this, kind of feeling resentful and sorry for myself. But then after a few days, I realized that I had to stop focusing on her and what kind of a friend she was being, whether she was being right or wrong, fair or unfair. Instead, I should focus on what kind of a friend I can be. As soon as I change focus, then all my feeling of being upset and being a victim just vanished away. And I got so much strength and courage. I thought, fine, be however you want to be. I'm not going to get upset over petty things. I'm, no matter what happens, I'm going to remain a good friend. Whenever I think of her, I just I feel grateful because I learned so much from her through the beginning phase, through her kindness and care, but even more so in the second phase through her apparently uncaring and indifferent attitude, because that gave me a very clear picture of what I didn't want to be. Since then, when I see people acting in a way that I feel is hurtful, I really try to make a firm resolve that I myself may never be hurtful like that towards someone else. See, when we focus on our attitude and how true we are to our values, that gives us immense strength and courage. Actually, we feel kind of invincible because we have that self-confident that in any situation will provide us something to learn from. When people treat us well, we can learn how to treat others. And if people mistreat us, we can again make that firm resolve that we won't be like that ourselves. Amma always reminds us, she says, treat others how you'd like to be treated. If our focus is on how we can become a better human being, then no external situation can pull us down. That focus is like us, our boat having a very strong hull. It'll be ready for any kind of waters. Not only we are strong, but also it gives us an immense joy and the self, a, a feeling of self-fulfillment. In the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, there are so many examples of characters who get immense strength and courage through that focus on a higher principle. And that strength can pull them through very tough circumstances. There's countless examples, but I'd like to talk about Sumitra, Lakshmana's mother. You all know the story. Sri Rama has to go on exile into the forest for 14 years and Lakshmana and Sita are going to go with him. And the whole palace is devastated. Usually our focus is on Kausalya and Dasharatha and their immense grief. But if we think about it, the situation is just as heartbreaking for Sumitra. She also is going to be separated from her son for that, those 14 years. And we can see it in the passage in the Ramayana that describes this heart-wrenching scene of when the three are about to leave. And Sumitra weeps at the beginning, but she doesn't dwell on it. See, she doesn't even try to convince her son to change his mind and stay with her in Ayodhya. It's that focus she has on a higher principle that gives her such strength and courage because she's focused on the dharma of her son and also on the divinity of Sri Rama. And the courage she gets from that enables her to fulfill her role as a mother in the most noble and courageous way. She's able to give wholehearted support and encouragement to her son. It's a very famous shloka, her last words. She says, Ramam Dasharatham Vithi. No Rama, consider Rama to be your father. Mam Vithi Janaka Atma Jam. Consider Sita to be like me, your mother. Ayodhyam Atavim Vithi. Consider the forest to be Ayodhya. Gacha Tata Yatha Sukham. And go happily, my son. 
Just think of the extremely challenging situation she was in. And yet she was able to, in, to give such inspiring words. She was so courageous, so full of wisdom. She was able to go beyond her own grief because of her focus on such a higher goal. She's really an inspiring example for all of us. A few days ago, I was on the, I had a phone call with my brother and we discussed something that made me think a little. And I just like to share with you some of my fo the thoughts I had after that. See, my brother lives with his wife and the two of them get on very well. But there's a slight, there's an area where they, they have a difference. There's a difference in their approach to life. So my brother was explaining this to me. He said that his, his attitude is in any situation, he tries to assume the worst case scenario. For example, when he's applying for a job, he'll say, anyway, there are so many applicants. It will be a complete miracle if they chose me. I most likely will not get the job. We shouldn't even think about it. Now they're trying to purchase a house. So same thing. He says, anyway, let's just assume it's not going to work. So many things could go wrong in the purchase. Let's just think it's a miracle if we get the house. He was explaining to me this attitude of his is in a way a kind of self-protection me mechanism. He tries to keep his hopes as low as possible so that he doesn't have to be majorly disappointed if things don't go the way he'd like. His wife, on the other hand, is pretty different. This attitude drives her crazy. She says, no, come on, let's be positive. You will get the job. We will be able to get the house. So this is their ongoing little argument. If we look at it, in a way, there is sense, some sense, there's a good positive element in each of their attitudes, because for my brother, there is sense in his attitude, seeing as it does come from a realistic view of the world. It's true, life does bring us different kinds of, of experiences, both pleasure and pain, success and failure. It's very unpredictable. So that's true, but at the same time, there is an element of kind of a negative element of worry as well in his attitude. Whereas his wife, we can see it's very good. Her positive attitude is very positive. It's very good. But at the same time, we need to look if, if things don't go out the way we expect, we might get very disappointed. See, the, the main problem is when our focus is on an external outcome. If our focus is on an external outcome, then the hull of our boat might not be strong enough to withhold difficult circumstances. If we're able to shift our focus from the external outcome to our own attitude, that'll give us, give us immense strength and security within. All of us crave security and stability in all sorts of aspects, in our finances, in our relationships, in our studying, in where we live. In everything, we, we crave stability. But in reality, none of these are guaranteed because the very nature of life is that it's in constant change. But the real insurance is when we can have that firm conviction that whatever happens is going to be okay, to have that deep trust in life. If our number one goal is to become a better human being, then nothing can bring us down. See, often at the beginning of the year, we like to make a new year resolution. So I can speak from my experience. I know that doesn't always work out. Sometimes it only lasts for a few weeks, but the best maybe a few months. But after some time, it usually fizzles out. What I suggest we should do is every day, take a few moments every morning to take a new day resolution. We can close our eyes, take a few deep breaths to relax. Then we can think of some things that make us happy, things that we love just to come to a positive frame of mind. Then we can just visualize, what kind of a person do I want to be today? What kind of values do I want to uphold? How do I want to express that through my actions and through my interactions? If we're able to do this new day resolution just for a few moments every morning, it'll give us an immense lakshya bodha to our life, a sense of purpose, a higher goal. And with that, no waves will be able to break us. We'll have a sturdy hull 
we'll be able to cut through any difficult waters or storms or anything. Not only will we be able to stay afloat, we'll be able to sail forward even in a storm. Okay, so we have a nice strong hull for our boat. Next, remember what I mentioned about the leaks? That's also part of the maintenance of the boat. Because it's, all, it's only natural when living in the world that sometimes negative thoughts or selfishness, narrow-mindedness, these negativities may seep into our mind. That's only natural. So we need to look at how to get rid of those negative waters that they pull us down. So for that, we need a, a magic water pump. So I would like to share two magic tricks with you, two like magic pumps. Those magic pumps are able will help us to get rid of our mental burdens within instants. So the first one is an attitude of gratitude. This is a simple trick to help us open our heart and become receptive. Amma always says, Elatinum nanni, Elatinodum nanni. Thank you for everything and say thank you to all. This should be our attitude. This is an essential pump. And when activated, it'll get rid of our negative feelings and thoughts within instants. We may think in today's lifestyle, it's a little bit difficult to develop that attitude. Because to be grateful is to appreciate what we have here and now. Whereas when we open up, when we look at our phone and go to Facebook or Instagram or WhatsApp, or any of these, social media usually give, gives us images that make us feel like we're missing out on something whether it's in terms of friends, of traveling, of clothing, dining experiences, so many things. And also countless advertisements try to convince us that we're not living life to its fullest if we don't have their product. That's why we need to put in extra effort to remember that we have so much to feel grateful for. Because usually we only start appreciating something once it's taken away from us. Just look at us, all of us now, in this pandemic. So many things that we took for granted before have been snatched away. But were we grateful for those things before? Did we even notice them or appreciate them? In fact, there's so many things that we can feel grateful for. A healthy body, a loving family, a helpful co-worker, a trustworthy friend, a roof over our head, a new, a new day when we wake up in the morning, fresh air to breathe, See, there's something really special about gratitude. This is, it's that we can't feel both grateful and depressed at the same time. The two can't coexist. If we feel grateful, we feel happy. And that gratitude gives us a very positive outlook. And also, it makes us live in the present. See, we don't brood about the past, and we also don't build castles in the air about our future. Often we think that if you're happy, then you'll be grateful. Actually, it's the other way around. If we're grateful, we're happy. So what, we can try this and see what kind of a difference it makes in our life. See, let's just try this small thing. Every day when we wake up, let's take a few seconds just to really feel grateful, to say thank you for everything that we have. And also before we go to bed at night, just take a few moments to say thank you. Even if we do just this, it'll really make a difference in our life because that attitude of gratitude will start becoming part of us. In every, it'll come, start coming into every moment of our day. It's actually just a small adjustment of perspective, but it makes such a difference because the more grateful we feel, the less room there is for negative thoughts. So it's a magic pump. Try it, you'll see it works wonders. It gets rid of any feelings of like despair or depression that pull us down within moments. Amma always says, when we have gratitude, grace flows into our life. So that's the pump number one. The pump number two is that of giving. Because whenever we give, we come a little out of our selfishness, of our ego box. We forget ourselves for those moments. And that forgetting of ourselves is the secret to happiness. I'd like to share a story with you that happened here in last Christmas in the ashram. 
Basically, the tradition here is on Christmas Eve, there's some cultural programs, and then large um, trays of chocolate cake are brought up to Amma. Amma blesses each tray that are then given out as prasad to all. So in the last, in last year, I was sitting in the hall watching the trays of chocolate cake being taken to Amma. See, there's, um, there's several people who work in the bakery all year round. And usually this Christmas Eve event is the one chance in the year that they get to bring something that they've made to Amma directly. So I was watching the people take the cakes to Amma. And I noticed that there was one person who works in the bakery who hadn't come up with a tray. Her name is Sri Devi. So later on, I went to the cake prasad distribution area and I saw Sri Devi there and she smiled at me. So I went up to her and I said, Sri Devi, I didn't see you go up to Amma with a cake. What happened? Did you take a tray? She replied to me with a beaming smile. She said, no, do you know what happened? At the last minute, I gave the tray to my friend so she could get a chance near Amma. And guess what? Her tray ended up being the last one to go to Amma. So she got to spend so much time next to Amma because Amma took time with that tray and was taking pieces out and giving it to the kids sitting around. So my friend got such a nice chance next to Amma, I'm so happy. I was so touched to hear, hear Sri Devi's experience and to see how selfless what, what a sacrifice she had done. She had really forgotten herself by giving something that was dearest to her heart, which was that chance to spend some time near Amma. And she was just thinking of the joy of her friend. She wasn't expecting any reward or acknowledgement. I was really inspired by her selfless attitude. If we look at Amma's life, we can see it's just the very essence of Amma's life is giving. Amma gives it every moment. And have any of us seen anyone as happy as Amma? This total and complete giving of herself is the secret to Amma's bliss. And this is really a precious message for us. Some people may consider that on that Christmas Eve night, Sri Devi's friend hit the jackpot by being able to spend so much time near Amma. But I disagree. I think that Sri Devi got the jackpot because I saw that smile on her face, that joy of having been able to give a gift to someone, something that was very precious. She had forgotten herself in those moments. And it's in our acts of sacrifice and love that we find real happiness. There's something I, I heard about, a nice event that happened um, just this last year in December in the US. People called it the chain of kindness. I think it was in the beginning of December in Minnesota in a drive through restaurant. So one person, one customer was driving through and they ordered their food, paid for his order, received his food and paid for his order. And then he gave some extra money and said, please use this money to pay for the order of the next person who comes along, the next customer, whoever it may be. So the person working at the restaurant accepted the money and the man drew, he went off with his car. So then the next customer pulled up and the restaurant worker said, okay, ma'am, the gentleman who just was ahead of you gave some paid in advance for your meal also. So would you like to pay for the meal at the next car that'll come along? The lady didn't even think for a second. She immediately agreed, she said, yes, of course, let's go for it. And so she paid in advance. And guess what? This went on and on and on for two whole days, uninterrupted. Basically, 900 cars all decided to pay for the meal of the person coming behind them. An inspiring act of giving, giving to people who are complete strangers. You don't know which car is going to come up behind you. But we need to remember that giving isn't only about giving a material object or giving money or anything like that. It's just as much about giving our care, giving our attention, giving a kind word, giving a caring smile. Amma says, a kind word, a loving glance, a small gesture of help, these can make our lives much brighter. What determines the value of our life is not what we have gained, but what we have given. If 
few days ago, I was talking to a friend of mine and she was recalling a time about 20 years ago when her son was admitted in the hospital. Of course, it was a very challenging time for her. But to this day, 20 years later, she still remembers one of the ladies who was working at one of the food counters in the hospital. That food counter was a hub of activity. It was always busy, there was queue and people coming to get their tea and coffee and everything. But even amongst all that busyness, this one lady at the counter always took the extra second to look at the customer, the person in front of her, and give them a genuine, pairing smile, a present smile. My friend said to me that that was really like a breath of fresh air for her. And it would put a smile on her face, a smile that she could then take back to her sick son. See, we need to remember that nothing is insignificant. Even the smallest of our gestures, of our smiles, anything like this, can have such a positive impact on the people around us. The problem is that most of the time, we end up being so caught up in our lives that we don't really have the time or the presence to really smile at someone, to really give our presence. See, even when we're able to listen to someone, that's giving. That's a gift in itself, to be able to give our attention and our listening. If we step back a moment and look at our conversations, we can see that we very rarely listen to the other person. Most of the time, we're trying to see what we can find into the conversation. Our conversations like monologues that just exclude the other. And this lack of listening is a major cause for difficulties in our relationships. People usually don't seek solutions or advice and suggestions. Just people want to be heard. They want to be understood. A few years ago, when I first came to the ashram, I was going through a little bit of a hard time and I didn't really know who to tell or who, who, who to turn to. Then one day, I was sitting a few people away from Amma and Amma motioned me to come close to her. So I went and I whispered in Amma's ear, just one sentence in English, of just that summarized how I was feeling, the difficulties I was going through. And Amma looked into my eyes and just said two words. She said, I understand. With those words of Amma, I felt like a, just a huge burden just melted away. Just that feeling understood, feeling heard. It's so important. But also, there's another side. See, I want to talk, tell you an example. Um, a few years ago also, I was having a kind of bit a down in the dumps kind of a day. I was just feeling a bit sad and I couldn't really figure out why. Then this one lady came to me and said, started telling me her problems. She was going through a very tough time and she started explaining to me some of the challenges she was going through. So I listened to her for like half an hour maybe. I really tried to focus on what she was saying and understanding her situation. So she spoke to me and then left. And when she left, I realized with wonder that my sadness had just vanished completely. Just that effort of going, coming out of my little world to tune into someone else's, else's world had been enough just to get me out of all my, my feeling so negative. Amma is like the sun because every moment she's giving, giving herself. But we also need to really try at our level, see what we can give. We can give our attention, give our smile, give our presence. All our relationships will become richer from that and stronger and we'll become so much happier. Because in giving, we become happy. Because in those moments, we come a little bit out of our selfishness and ego. In those moments, we're pumping some of those stagnant and dirty waters of our selfishness. We're getting rid of them. We're all beyond blessed to have Amma before us as the most incredible example of a life completely grounded in the highest of values. She's like a blazing torch before us, lighting up the way. But not only that, she's also beside us in every step, holding our hand. Amma sometimes says, you know how a mother looks at her newborn infant? She looks at the child 
waiting eagerly to see signs of the child's growth in their arms and legs. Amma says she's the same. Amma looks at us, just waiting to see us grow. Just imagine the glow of pride and love that would blossom on Amma's face if we were able to live a life grounded in the values she embodies. Let's all remember that we're in this together. Let's take these challenging times in our stride. The attitude, our attitude at every moment is shaping the person we become, the human being that we become. Let's not be weak and cowardly in the face of challenge. Rather, let's use this, let's consider this a good opportunity to press the reset button, to reaffirm our commitment to noble values. That way, the hull of our boat is going to be extremely strong and ready for anything. I pray that each and every one of us is able to use this time to grow and to get the strength to dedicate our lives for serving the world. Together, let us grow as a generation of Amma's bright and shining stars. Om Amriteshwari Namaha. As the As light the guides a lost voyager in the pitch darkness, let these words and spirituality be the guiding light for our life. It was truly motivational for our youth to overcome the problems we face these days. And by the way, you have a beautiful smile. We are deeply indebted for your words of wisdom, Amadaji, and also your experience with Amma. Also for giving us some time from your busy schedule. I thank everyone who have joined and supported in making this event a huge success. My thank you would be incomplete if I failed to thank our beloved Amma for showering her immense grace.